Welcome back to the test design course. Our focus today is on specification based testing and that's also the focus of the course assignment. If you haven't started the assignment already, start now. Today's only required reading is the heuristic test strategy model. It's necessary for the assignment. The idea of specification based testing seems simple. You have a program, you have a spec, you test the program against the spec. People often teach spec-based testing with a little toy specification that runs a page or two. The students analyze it in great detail. They find lots of ambiguities that lead to test cases. But now try scaling that to the real world. Multiply this up to a specification that runs thousands of pages. And it's not just one document. There's a spec for this part of the program, and a spec for that part of the program, and there are lots of specs for communication between programs, and this has been going on for years, so there are dozens of versions of each of the specs. And some of the specs from 2005 are more up to date, more accurate than the specs from 2010. Now that's what I'm used to. With real world products, just figuring out what the specification is and what it says might be the most difficult part of spec-based testing. I use a set of eight questions to guide my analysis of a specification. These don't tell me how to test, but they help me figure out what to test and why and who cares about the results. Textbooks often describe product development as contract-based. In their nice and tidy, simplified little textbook world, a customer makes a contract with your company to create a product, and that contract includes a thick document with specifications stamped on the front cover. And that specification has everything you need to know about the product. Your company's task, according to the textbook, is to develop a product that does what this specification says it should do. And the testing task is to verify that the program actually conforms to that specification. Well, good luck. When you go beyond the textbook, even if there is a contract, and even if that contract does include a specification, the real specification is not completely contained in that document. For example, suppose your contract specification says the program should print the average of a group of numbers. Does the specification include a subspecification that defines all the rules of arithmetic? Well, probably not, but that creates a problem. Programs store floating point numbers to limited precision. Arithmetic is subject to rounding errors. So given that there are going to be rounding errors, which ones are acceptable? Does the specification tell you that? Probably not. If your company and your customer ever argued about this, you'd probably end up settling the argument by referring to IEEE standard 724 for floating point arithmetic. In effect, this standard is part of your specification, even though it's never mentioned in your specification. So even when you have a contractual specification, the real specification includes a bunch of documents that were written at different times for different readers that say different things, sometimes even contradictory things. And in most cases, you don't have a specification that even pretends to be complete or legally enforceable. Any document that people would reasonably trust as a description of what your product can do, or should do, or how it does it, is part of the specification that you might have to take into account. That might include advertisements, help files, user documentation, even books written by people who have no connection with your company at all. Part of the spec-based testing task is to gather the documents that make up the specification and figure out what parts of the product are covered by the spec, what parts are covered by more than one spec, and what parts are just unspecified. As the product evolves, does the spec evolve with it? If so, how do you know you have the right version of the specification? How long does it take you to find out that the spec's been changed and what the changes are? One of the most common complaints that I've heard from testers is that they find something that's obviously wrong with the product, but when they report it, the programmer says, that's how it's supposed to work. And since the spec doesn't explicitly contradict that, the tester feels he has nothing to rely on to make his case. I talked about this in the bug advocacy course. What I said there was, you're probably not seen as an expert in the design of the product. So if you want to make effective criticisms, you have to tie them to a credible source. The spec is a potentially credible source, but that's not going to help you with something that's not in the spec, or worse, with something that the spec describes as acceptable. If you find yourself in this situation, don't whine that no one will listen to you. That's what too many testers do. It doesn't do anything good. Look for an implicit specification instead. An implicit spec is a source that's not part of the official specification, but programmers or other stakeholders with influence will accept it as authoritative. So here are some examples of implicit specs. 
Suppose you're testing a product design for the Macintosh and its user interface is inconsistent with the usual designs of Mac products. You could write a bug report that says, in my opinion, this is inconsistent with Macintosh norms. Or you could write a report that says, this is inconsistent with page 43 of the Apple Human Interface Guidelines. Which do you think is going to be seen as more credible? The IEEE floating point standard and Apple's Human Interface Guidelines are just two of many examples of specifications, standards, and guidelines written by other people, never even mentioned in most product specs, but that are probably very persuasive to your development team. Another class of implicit specification is documents written to explain the product and management. For example, when I used to work as a software development manager for a software publisher, part of our challenge was convincing management to fund the project. So we made presentations that described what we wanted to create and why people would buy it. Now imagine being a tester on my project. Imagine that you feel that one of the tasks in my project is too hard for a normal human to do. Yeah, you can do it, but it's awkward. It takes too many steps. It's too hard to learn. It's too easy to make mistakes with it. So even though users can do the task, uh, most people aren't going to bother. Well, your most powerful argument is going to be to quote a management presentation that promises that this product will feature this task. Management's going to expect this to be designed so well that people will want to use it and will want to tell their friends about it. Because my presentation said this is one of the reasons to build this product. It doesn't matter whether my presentation is included in an official spec. Management will treat that presentation as a promise, and if my product doesn't live up to it, well, that's not acceptable. Maintenance and support documents also provide useful implicit specs. Suppose someone reported a bug a year ago, but it didn't get fixed. You want it fixed now in the new version of the product. What did the project manager say a year ago when she deferred the bug? Did she explain what was needed to fix it and promise to fix it next time? How many people complained about the bug? Anyone important? Did anyone stop using the product because of the bug? Ask for a refund? Write about it in their articles on the web? Did it get in a magazine? Did any stakeholders with influence comment on the bug at that time? You can quote any of this in your argument that it's time to fix this problem. It's not in the spec, but some people will find this information very credible. You can also get a lot of useful information from the code and from interviews of knowledgeable or influential people. Your company uses tools and code libraries and content from other sources. Their specs are your specs. Finally, look at competing products. In the Foundations and Bug Advocacy courses, you worked with OpenOffice. Well, Microsoft Office is an implicit specification for OpenOffice. Something works a certain way in Microsoft, you should expect it to work that way or better in OpenOffice. Anything that drives people's expectations of the product is a specification. You might not agree with all those expectations, but remember, quality is valued as some person, not necessarily you. If someone has a reasonable basis for expecting the product to do something, or to have some other attribute, and the product doesn't meet that expectation, then for that person, that's a failure of quality.